We've all been on a commercial airliner. The pilot gently throttles back, glides over the runway, gracefully pitches the aircraft's nose up, a technique called the flare, and kisses the tarmac with a gentle touch. The goal is buttery smooth. A carrier deck is about 1,092 feet long, but that's the entire ship. The actual landing area, where the four arresting wires lie, is only about 150 feet. A steel postage stamp, adrift in the ocean, moving at 30 miles per hour, and pitching and rolling violently in heavy seas. If a pilot tried to grease it on and slow down, they'd face aviation's greatest enemy, a stall. If they fly too slow and miss the last wire, they won't have enough airspeed to get airborne. They'll simply fall off the edge of the deck and plunge into the sea in a $70 million steel coffin. At the very instant the wheels are about to smack the deck, they shove the throttles to about 80% thrust, or even military power. They are assuming they will miss. Their entire philosophy is summed up in one phrase, land by preparing to take off. They keep enough energy in the engines so that if and when the tail hook misses the wire, the jet will continue rocketing forward and launch itself airborne. This is the bolter procedure. They watch the light on the aircraft, which they call the meat ball, a visual glide slope indicator that tells the pilot if they're too high or too low. If anything is off by even an inch, a gust of wind, a lurch of the ship, the LSO won't hesitate. They'll key the mic and scream two words over the radio that every pilot respects like an act of God. Wave off. Wave off. You take them to a place called FCLP, Field Carrier Landing Practice. While civilian pilots practice hundreds of soft landings, Navy pilots must practice hundreds of controlled crashes of their multi-million dollar jets onto concrete. They practice this controlled crash over and over again. And most importantly, they practice the bolter. They constantly perform touch and goes, touching their wheels to the runway, jamming the throttles to full, and taking off again. They repeat this until it's no longer a thought. It becomes a reflex. It is instinct. Land doesn't pitch. Land doesn't roll. That's what they face on every landing. Moment 1. 0, 0.0 seconds. Impact. The pilot feels a thump, a hit hard enough to make you think the landing gear just snapped. They're still at high power. Moment 2. 0 0.5 seconds. Reaction. Instead of feeling the 5G deceleration pulling them back, snapping their head into the harness, they feel nothing. The jet is still rocketing forward. Moment 3, 1.0 seconds. Command. At the same time, the LSO screams, Bolter, 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 over the radio. There is no time to think. The pilot must trust the command. Moment 4, 1.5 seconds. Action. The pilot shoves the throttles to 100%, if not already there, pulls the stick back, and trusts that their two General Electric F1 1414 turbofans will overcome gravity and launch them off the edge of the deck. They lower their hook again and prepare to do the entire process over. For us, it's the most heart stopping moment of our lives. For them, it's a Tuesday. It is professionalism honed to perfection. It relies on one critical assumption. The jet is operating perfectly. But what happens when a bolter isn't an option? They can't bolter forever. They're running out of fuel. They have to land. Now there is no bolter. There is no wave off. This is when the captain on the bridge looks down at the flight deck and gives one of the most terrifying commands. Rig the barricade. And that's when an entirely different, far more terrifying scenario begins. Rig the barricade. 
The crippled jet is circling overhead, and its fuel gauge is ticking down to zero. The flight deck crew has, at most, a few minutes. It's a race between human skill on the deck and the remaining fuel in the dying jet. It's not a tennis net. This is a wall of engineering marvel, designed to catch a 20-ton jet. Here's the genius part. This netting is directly connected to the very hydraulic system lying beneath the flight deck, the same engine that powers the arresting wires we just saw. It's essentially a gigantic desperate version of an arresting wire designed to snag anything it can grab, wings, fuselage, even the cockpit. They are the crash and salvage team. 99% of the time, their job is to stand by for fires, fuel leaks, or ordnance handling. But for this 1%, they are the last line of defense. Imagine having to run out onto an eight-lane highway during rush hour to erect a barrier, knowing a runaway truck is hurtling towards you. That's their job. They must work with perfect precision under unimaginable pressure, while a man-made hurricane of helicopter rotors and jet engines tries to blow them off the deck. Let's go back to the Vietnam War on the USS Hancock. An A-4 Skyhawk returns with a 250-pound bomb jammed, unable to release. Its landing gear is also damaged. It cannot land normally. They rigged the barricade. The red shirts charged into the inferno, suppressing the flames around the cooking bomb, and saved the pilot. It's a brutal truth. The barricade saves the pilot, but it destroys the jet. And sometimes it's just the beginning of another catastrophe. They've trained their entire lives to hit a two inch wide wire. Now their command has completely changed. Fly directly into the net. They are no longer a surgeon. They are a hammer. They must fly as slow as possible to reduce impact forces, but still fast enough to maintain, maintain lift. They must fly directly into the center too high and they'll sail over the net and plunge into the sea, too low and they'll strike their landing gear or belly on the deck before hitting the net, tumbling and disintegrating. There are no second chances. The sound is a sickening roar of tearing metal and a whoosh of the hydraulic system beneath the deck trying to absorb an unimaginable amount of kinetic energy. The net wraps around the wings, ripping fuel tanks open. Landing gear shatters engines warp. The jet often spins 90 degrees or even flips upside down. It is a horrific sight. The red shirts. They charge into the flames. They charge into the spilling fuel. Their goal isn't to save the jet. That's already too late. Their goal is to save the pilot. They use metal saws to cut through the canopy. They drag the dazed pilot from the wreckage while their teammates douse thousands of gallons of firefighting foam to prevent that ticking time bomb from exploding. And that's a trade the Navy is willing to make every single time. Sacrifice $70 million of steel to save one priceless life. The barricade has done its job. But both of these procedures assume you have one thing, time. Time to circle. Time to rig the net. What happens when you have no time? What happens when you've just been launched going 170 miles per hour and your engine suddenly quits? You can't bolter. You can't go back for the barricade. You have 0.5 seconds. At this point, there is only one last option. One that isn't about saving the plane, but about escaping it. This is when you have to trust your seat. But both of these procedures assume you have one thing, time. Time to circle, time to rig the net. What happens when you have no time? At this point, there is only one last option. One that isn't about saving the plane, but about escaping it. This is when you have to trust your seat. The two pilots had less than two seconds before hitting the water. And then, they survived. This is not just a seat. This is a personal rocket machine. 
an engineering marvel designed for a single purpose, to get the pilot out of a pile of scrap metal in an instant. 1. Explosive bolts blow off the cockpit canopy. 2. A rocket motor beneath the seat ignites, generating immense g-forces, blasting the pilot clear of the jet at hundreds of miles per hour. 3. The seat automatically deploys a parachute, inflates a life raft, and activates an emergency beacon. The entire process happens faster than a blink of an eye. The g-force the pilot endures isn't a push, it's an explosion. We're talking 14 to 20 Gs. That's 20 times their own body weight. This is such brutal G-force that, as a veteran shared in our comments, ejection almost always causes severe spinal injury. But it's an impossible choice. Certain death with the jet, or face potential disability, but live. They call this zero-zero capability. It can save you at zero altitude and zero speed. It is the final miracle of aviation engineering. So, they built one of the most terrifying test facilities on Earth, the Holloman High Speed Test Track. Then, they activate the ejection seat. They use the world's most advanced, multi-hundred-thousand-dollar test dummies, rigged with hundreds of sensors. These dummies precisely measure every force on the spine, every impact on the skull, every potential for injury. The data from these high-tech executions is fed back to the engineers. They adjust the ejection angle, the rocket thrust, the parachute deployment timing, all to add even 1% more chance of survival for the pilot. As soon as the chute deploys, the Angel races to the location. A brave rescue swimmer, one of the most rigorously trained individuals in the world, will leap into the sea to secure the pilot from drowning, hypothermia, or worse, sharks. Within minutes, the pilot is hoisted aboard the helicopter, safe. They are alive. But their $70 million jet now rests thousands of feet beneath the ocean floor. It's a treasure trove of technological secrets. Radar systems, electronic warfare software, classified materials. It cannot fall into enemy hands. Now it's time for the unsung heroes of the deep, the Navy's Mobile Diving and Salvage Unit. They use mini-submarines, remotely operated vehicles, to scour the seabed. Once the wreckage is located, they face an almost impossible task. How do you rig and lift a 15-ton pile of scrap metal from a depth that could be greater than the Empire State Building? It costs millions of dollars, but it must be done. They will sacrifice the machine to save the man. And then they will dive into hell to bring that machine back. Every piece of salvaged wreckage is analyzed by investigators. The black box will tell them what went wrong. And that lesson will be incorporated into the next aircraft designs, the next training procedures, making the system just a little bit safer. Three layers of defense, three scenarios for failure, each more terrifying than the last. But there is a common thread that binds them all together. It's not the technology. It's not the steel. It's something intangible. And that's what makes this force invincible. You might wonder, why take these risks? Why operate at the absolute limits of man and machine? The answer lies here. It is 4.5 acres of sovereign American territory, a floating city, capable of moving to any global flashpoint within days. It is a 100,000-ton warning to adversaries and a guarantee to allies. The ability to maintain flight operations despite failure is what creates that deterrence. Every bolter is a training exercise. Every barricade rigged is a lesson learned. Every crash, however tragic, is analyzed to make the system safer, stronger, more reliable. The ability to embrace risk, failure, and adapt is what makes this force powerful. It's not the technology. It's not the steel. It's something intangible. It is trust. This is the story of the missed landing. It is not a story of machines failing, but of humans succeeding. 
It is the pilot's absolute trust in the LSO, their guardian angel, that the wave off command is correct. It is the LSO's trust in the pilot that they will obey the bolter command instantly, without hesitation. It is the fuel-starved pilot's trust in the red shirts on the deck that they will rig the net in time. And it is the entire crew's trust in the nameless engineers who designed that ejection seat to work perfectly in that fateful 0.5 seconds. And when that workday goes wrong, these extraordinary procedures and the indomitable spirit of the people who execute them ensure that these heroes can fly, fight, and come home safe. If you learned something today about the incredible courage and professionalism of Navy pilots and flight deck crews, please show your respect by hitting the like button and subscribe to our channel where we delve into real stories of military heroes you won't find anywhere else. Finally, we want to hear from you in the comments. What job do you think is the most terrifying? The pilot who has to perform a controlled crash into a net? The LSO who stands at the edge of the deck making life or death decisions in three seconds? Or the red shirts who have to run out and rig the net in front of an oncoming jet? Let us know your thoughts. Thanks for watching. Stay proud.